So I'm here, this is Connor Neal from Vistage in Barcelona, holding in my hands the book, The Job of the CEO by Voldemar Schmidt, who for about 30 years was CEO of various divisions leading up to running a 50,000 employee business. Maybe Voldemar, if you just talk a little bit about, you know, what was that final role as a CEO and where are you now? And why did you write, why did you write this book? Let me start with the reason why I wrote the book. Um, I've been, uh, teaching leadership at business schools uh, to MBA students a lot. And after some time, I decided to answer the many questions I had by writing a book. And therefore I wrote a book called From MBA to CEO, which I did in uh, cooperation with 200 students from 10 business schools around the world. And I did some research, I visited these schools. Um, once the book was out, um, I started to get readers who said to me, you know, I'm not, an MBA, but your book is very, very useful also for me. So that made me think that maybe I should make a more generic version of my experiences, not just for MBAs. And that's why I wrote the book. And it's basically for people who would like to become CEOs, people who are CEOs and who want to progress uh, during the executive career. And then lastly, a segment of people like myself who at the end of their CEO career start thinking about what to do with their lives uh, privately and professionally. What is the job of the CEO? You know, in my experience, uh, I can portray it as, as very, very simple. It is to take charge of making sure that the company that you lead has a proper business plan, which is deeply rooted in the organization. So that's task number one. Task number two is then to assemble a team around with you who buy into, who are part of the business plan and who will do their parts. And then finally, there's the execution of it. I've come across a lot of people who are very good at selling, but they are poor at delivering. And this is something that really you notice in the CEO. You have people who can tell a good story, but many of them cannot deliver. They cannot execute. So in simple terms, it's formulate a vision, a business plan, a strategy, assemble a team, and, and then uh, execute. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's so much more to it, and that's why you need to read a book about it. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. this, this book, we, we're not attempting in this conversation to transmit everything that is in this book. Uh, and I think, you know, the, you talk about the journey up to CEO. What, what types of things put someone in a position that they are good at developing a strategy or a business plan or a vision for the business? I, I believe that if you want to be a successful CEO over a long period, then it is not enough that you know your product or your service. It's not enough that you know your numbers and it's not enough that you know your customers. In other words, if you're an engineer, you should also to get get to know your numbers and your customers. If you're an accountant, you should get to know your uh, product and your customers. And, and uh, that's very, very important mm -hmm. uh, that you, you know all three parts of your business. Yeah. And I guess you, know, you and I both spend a great deal, deal of our life in the business school environment among MBAs, executives, senior yeah. leaders. What parts of the CEO job do, do people not pick up in the MBA business school environment? What, what are the things that you think people need to work with themselves outside of formal training to really get good at? And you know, in, the, in the three areas of vision, people selecting and creating teams out of people, and the third of executing. I think the best way for me to, to illustrate my view on this is that often you hear people talk about management or leadership. And for me, it's not one or the other. Like with many other things in life, it's not one or the other, it's both. Mm -hmm. um, so management is about the techniques and, and you can learn those in a business school. Mm -hmm. Whereas I would say that to teach leadership in a business school uh, is not something for professors. 
uh, if you want to, uh, let's say, do credible lessons, uh, then you have to have, have, to have uh, the leadership experience yourself. And that's why many business schools, they bring in executives like, like myself and, and, and many others, because uh, this is not something you can, you can teach in a, in, in, in a classroom in, as an academic exercise. Hmm. And you know, if you think back on your time as CEO, what are some of the really difficult decisions you had to take? Oh, there are many. Uh, most decisions are, are difficult, but, but the good news is that uh, there's not always only one answer to a question. It's, it's the answer that you, you believe in uh, that you can then execute on, but, but it requires that you have a, a reasonably good sense of making good decisions mm -hmm. and, and you have a judgment uh, to that. One thing that, that I hasten to say is that <clears throat> I've worked a lot with uh, people with financial background in private equity and other businesses. And there's a tendency that they believe that they can find the truth in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And you cannot find the truth in the numbers. Of course, you have to know your numbers, but you cannot find the answers uh, in, in the numbers. Um, it is a judgment of, uh, based on your experience, your sense of the people that you are in front of you. Um, uh, I've had to take many, many, many diff difficult decisions um, and um, I've made many good decisions, but I've certainly also made some bad ones. And I think where most of us make, or have the, 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 let's say the lowest hit rate is on employing people. Right. Because there's, there's no formula where you can make sure that, that you get 10 out of 10. Um, you have to do your homework. Uh, you have to, at the end, end up making a judgment yeah. uh, on people. That's really um, not something that you can, you can learn. It's experience that drives it. We had Jim Collins at the big global Vistage mm -hmm. leadership meeting, and he shared his 12 questions that come from his 25 years of work. And at the end, he said, the single most important talent of leadership is attracting, selecting, and putting the right people in the right roles. Absolutely. And I would add to that, um, if you can, uh, recruit people who are better than yourself. This uh, has been a very good uh, experience for me. I've often done that. And this is how you build good teams. And you should certainly not fall in the trap that I think most of us fall in to begin with in our careers, uh, which is to recruit people who look like yourself. Um, in football terms, you would never have a winning team with 11 messes uh, and the same in business, you would never have a winning team with uh, five engineers or five accountants or five marketing people. You have to have a, a mixture of uh, all. Yeah. And what sort of things did you do? So your big CEO role was at ISS, which would be a global. Yes. What... I, I had, the, I had the, the, the advantage when I got the job that I had been at all levels. So I started off as a country manager in Brazil when I was 32 years old. Uh, came from my first CEO job with 20 employees and we, we acquired a company with 1,200 employees. So for me, that was a major step up in my career. And I, I would say it was even bigger than when I stepped up to become group CEO. My next job was to be a CEO for our European business and our overseas business. And the last job in the group uh, was to be group CEO of a company which employed 250,000 people when I retired and now employs about half a million people. So mm -hmm. a major service uh, company in the world. And how did you set about attracting great people to join? Uh, how much was that internal development and how much did you use uh, some me means of bringing talent from the outside? It was a mixture of the two and I think it always has to be but it cannot be only external. So if you just use headhunters to bring in new people all the time, um, you will struggle with the culture of the company. Mm -hmm. And also you will, you will end up struggling in the sense that people realize that they can never get to the top jobs because every time there's a top job to be filled, you go to Egon Center or Russell Reynolds. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not very good for developing internal talents. So you have to watch the internal talent and from time to time, if you don't find it, you go external. 
but the risk is much bigger when you go external than, than when you go internal because for the internal candidates, you know the strengths and the weaknesses. At the external candidates, you think you know the strengths, but you definitely don't know about the weaknesses. So a much worse proposition. So internally, you have a good sense of weaknesses and a little bit of the potential. Yep. And all you see is the potential, but you don't know the hidden dangers. Nope. And you know, one of the questions we would ask a lot of the Vistage CEOs early on is we would ask them, you know, where are you going to be three to five years? And the second question we'll ask is one to 10, how good is your current team? 10, they are the team to deliver on this strategy. You know, seven, there's some good people there. There's some room that we need to, to fill in some talent. Four, this is not the team. Uh, and we spend quite a bit of time in, in our conversations in the group and in the sessions one-on-one -on -one with, with the leader of the group, looking at individuals and their potential. W you know, what are the sort of things you would look at internal people to decide that they have a big future and what would you do to give them the opportunities to, to let them know that you're thinking of them, but then also give them the opportunity to prove themselves? I have, uh, with, with, with good success, given a lot of people opportunities and see them grow. Mm -hmm. And this is one, one of the biggest joys of being a, a top leader, that when you see people grow. Sometimes I've had my doubts, but I have very, very seldom been disappointed. Uh, I've seen also people grow beyond what I thought uh, that they, they were capable of. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's like, if you have somebody, uh, put them in the water and see if they can swim. If they can swim in the small pool, you put them in the bigger pool, and at the very end, you put them in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, that's a lesson I've learned, and, and I've rarely been disappointed. But of course, well, when you give somebody a challenge, you have to be very clear on uh, the strategy. You know what what are the success criteria? What are the KPIs? What do you want to achieve? So you have to have a common vision of what you want to do. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. And you know, maybe to, to make this concrete, in, in a given day or a given week, um, you know, how would your calendar be allocated towards these three big parts of the role of the CEO? So there's setting the strategy and communicating the vision. There's people and all the things to do with people and execution. I, I had an inter interesting situation uh, when I was uh, group CEO. We had a very small head office in Copenhagen with about 45 people. And as I said, we employed 250,000 people in the world. And I was torn between people in the head office who said, you travel too much. I travel two to three days a week. And people out there saying, we never see you. But then my answer was, you know, we have 45 people in the head office and 250,000 people outside. Where do you think the logic would tell me to spend my time? It's out there. And this is how I spent most of my time uh, being a public company, of course, I spent a lot of time with investors and analysts as well. Uh, yeah. I spent time with, with customers. Um, I did not spend much time on uh, on making presentations at that time to uh, at conferences and so on because there was so much I had to do in the company. Mm -hmm. In terms of strategy, um, we, we spent a lot of time when I became CEO of uh, formulating a strategy and, and we then uh, had a process whereby we uh, made sure that it hit all the way out through the organization. So we started with uh, the top management team of five. Then we involved 150 who were the top managers in the group. And we asked everybody to go back to their own groups with the strategy. And before it was sort of sealed, we received feedback from everybody. Mm -hmm. And so when it came out and was announced, then everybody said, this is this is our strategy. It's not Valdemar's strategy. It's our strategy. And that made it really uh, quite unique. And it, 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 it also meant that everybody knew, you know, where we were going and they could figure out what their role would be for us to achieve what we had set out in, in our strategy. Yeah. No, I think we're not going to try and cover everything that's in this book. No. Perhaps what I'd like, I think we have 10 minutes more before... Uh, 
we mm-hmm. both have. I, I need to go and, and get my young daughter from the, the nursery, and I think you will be uh, interviewed by a journalist. So, yes. 10 minutes, and what I'd like in these 10 minutes is what is next for a CEO? If somebody today finds themselves in the role of a CEO, they're between 45, 50, 55, 60, what are the real options post CEO job? For, for someone who, who today is a CEO? First of all, I think the, uh, the, the whole issue of exit from a CEO job is, is very, very complicated because you have a lot of responsibility. You cannot just jump ship. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to make sure that, uh, that there's a plan. Although you're not, as a CEO, the one who is in charge of, the, of succession, I think it's your, 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 your right and, 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 and your duty to, to propose to the board a solution, and then the board decides what they want to do. Um, so getting the time, timing right is very difficult because in the job, there's always something more you can do. Uh, so in my case, um, I made a very conscious decision. The only person who knew about it was my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I went to the chairman, he was absolutely surprised. But I had clearly made up my mind. I tried everything that I had dreamt of. In my five years as CEO, the value of the company went up sixfold. We inquired, acquired more than 100 companies. We uh, formulated a new strategy. We had new head office, new organization. So I said, you know, I've, I've, I've done what I can. And I think it'd be good for the company and for me uh, that I make this move. And my thinking was that I want to... Uh, the factors that were important in you taking that decision? There was one factor, and, 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 and that still, still sits in my mind. We were having Easter holiday in our uh, summer home in south of France, mm-hmm. and the phone was ringing, uh, people were coming around, and then my daughter said, you know, that if you continue working like this, I'm afraid you will not, will not get very old. And that really started my thought process, uh, that I should do something different. Mm-hmm. And the difference between having a full-time CEO job and a portfolio other jobs is that you can, you, you can get the balance right. If, if you think the workload is too big as a CEO, you have no option, uh, you have to, to, to let it go. But if you have a portfolio, you can reduce uh, what you do. So I said, I'm going to have a portfolio of jobs. And, and since um, I was very visible in the small country in Denmark uh, for, for what I've done in, in the space of six months, I was chairman of five companies. I was on the first corporate governance committee. I was an executive in residence at IMD, so I had the whole loads of very, very interesting and, and fantastic jobs uh, from, from day one. Yeah. Uh, and it was never my, my intention to retire. It was my intention to have a new career, my second career. And does your daughter see that you're going to live for a long time now? I believe she does, yes. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, the advice I give to, to people when they are, sometimes they lose their job uh, when they're about 55, and come to me and say, you know, I'd really like you to tell me how I can have a, a new career uh, with um, a portfolio of board seats. My first question to these people is, are you financially independent? Mm-hmm. No, I need to have uh, an income of, let's say, 200,000 euro. Yeah. I said, then you go back and find yourself a job. Because if you depend on your board fees, you are not an independent director. And I, for certain, I, I for one, would not hire somebody like you to sit on any of my boards. Right. So, so, for, so that's a very, very important lesson. Yeah. So post CEO, the vision of being on a couple of boards, you must be in a position of financially independent. Your Absolutely. financial needs Absolutely. are covered. Yep. If uh, someone was in the case that they are not in the position that their financial needs are covered, what what options do they have post the CEO role? Um, they can uh, become independent, to be, become consultants uh, doing you know, project uh, jobs. Uh, they can perhaps also g- uh, go and find a, uh, a job as an interim uh, CEO. There, there, that's quite a, a big market for that. Um, and it's up to your own imagination with your network and your ideas to, uh, to find out what, what to do. I think one thing that characterizes uh, a good a CEO is that he never runs out of ideas. And this goes for the business, but should, should certainly also go for yourself. Yeah. And perhaps 
you mentioned when you were CEO, you didn't give a lot of presentations. You know, now no. your role is, whether it's in the business school or invited to conferences, What's, what role does networking play during your time as CEO? You know, number one, for your success as a CEO, but number two, for building the platform that allows you to, to have interesting options after the role of the CEO? It, it, it's very clear that, uh, that uh, I was in a good place uh, when I decided to leave my CEO job. Um, I had very strong relationship with, with in particular with one uh, of the large headhunters, uh, Econ Center, and, yeah. and some of the jobs I got was through them. I had been to Davos uh, more times than most people, uh, 25 or more times. Uh, so I had an international network from there. And then I had from within the industry that I've worked in, in the service industry, my, my network. Um, but I've lived uh, outside my own home country for many, many years. Uh, most of my sort of professional career has been outside. So I didn't have a big network in Denmark as such, but um, uh, it was certainly big, big enough for me to, to pick and choose what I would like uh, to do. Yeah. And the idea of how you build a relationship with the top search consultants. If, if you as a CEO don't have a relationship with Egon Zender or Hydrogen Struggles, you know, what can you do to be on their radar? Uh, they, they, I think they, all of them have a, uh, on their websites a, uh, uh, a place where you can go and, and become registered as uh, somebody that should be in their files. Mm -hmm. That should be followed up by a personal visit. And the best would be to get an introduction to get to the right partner because they are, they are specialized. They have people uh, who are in, in certain practices. It could be you know, industrial, it could be financial, it could be all of this. So find out who is the partner you should talk to and then over time build up the relationship. But of course, I must admit, having been a customer with them, then you are in a much better place because they know you, uh, because they've seen you over the years choose people and exclude candidates and so on. So they know what, what you stand for. And it, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, one does a favor to the other, but simply as humans, we, we, we choose the people we know, the, the people we understand, and, and therefore some of my, my uh, job, but, but, but maybe only, I don't know, 10, 15% of the jobs I've got has, has been through the, their, their sources. Well, I think you know, even if we look at the roots of this conversation, uh, you were a neighbor when I was a young kid growing up. Your wife Absolutely. was a good friend of my mother. Yeah. And I think uh, I reached out to your wife for help to prepare a gift for my mom's uh, 70th birthday. And That's that right, yeah. The, you know, yeah. through this whole connection to the book. Yeah. And the work. Yeah. So I guess, you know, that idea that network doesn't happen just in the blinkered world of I'm now business networking. No, uh, not at all. Uh, Connor, Connor if, if I may, I would like to, um, to point to one paragraph, uh, 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 one part of the book, yeah. which um, people have found useful and, and which I spent a lot of time on. I've chosen, I think it's about 130, 140 uh, dilemmas that you come across in your private life and in your professional life yeah. um, uh, as, as a CEO. And I've organized them from A to Z. And yeah. to illustrate my point, it, it is that I, I take arrogant, arrogance. And what I say is uh, arrogance is the worst enemy of great leadership. If you are born arrogant, it is unlikely that you will become a successful CEO over a very long period. On the other hand, if you are a successful CEO of a very long period, the risk of becoming arrogant is enormous. Mm -hmm. And you need, therefore you need somebody who can keep you on track. And yeah. it, people ask me then, who has kept you on track if, if you think you've been on track? Be my wife. And as late as when I was um, preparing the book, when it came to designing the, the, uh, the book and the front page, I had seen uh, Sir John Egan's book about how he saved Jaguar. Mm -hmm. And on the front page, you, you see this man, suntanned, white shirt, nice watch, and uh, sitting there, so I went to the photographer, had a nice picture taken. When I came home with the picture, my wife Britta said, what's that picture for? 
I said, it's for my book. It said, over my dead body. Mm-hmm. So the picture is not on my book. It sits in black and white way back in the book. Yeah. So you have to have somebody who keeps you uh, on track. There's the uh, yeah. Yeah. way back exactly. on exactly. Exactly. 46. Exactly. Uh, so arrogance is, is something that, uh, that is really important. So I've organized these dilemmas yeah. from A to Z. And it's not like a dictionary where you find answers. And the whole purpose of my book is uh, that hopefully you can become inspired to find your own way to uh, have a successful career. Yeah. And that, that's all I have set out to do. Good. Well, I think, Valdemar, a pleasure to speak to you. This time, not as a neighbor who kicked a football into your garden, <laughs> not as someone looking for your wife's help to help uh, put together a gift, but uh, you know, very inspiring. And I think that section of the book, which is from uh, page 172 right through to the end, where it's just practical examples of s- dilemmas in work-life balance, in work, in what do I do? It, it's just a wonderful range of all the little detailed challenges the, that face us. Yeah. And, you know, before we began the call, we were saying that teaching leadership, that the problem to any leadership question is the answer is it depends. And having someone like your wife, and, and I share that, you know, now uh, my wife is an incredible source of balance. And while I can have, you know, euphoria and then see the world negative, she just has a steady sense of what's right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she, I see the potential in people. She sees what they're really going to deliver. Mm -hmm. And people... My my, my wife is a daughter of an auditor. Uh, And sometimes I say to her, you see the, the holes in the cheese before you see the cheese. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the antidote yeah. to arrogance yeah. is people around you that don't forget who you are. Exactly. So, uh, uh, if, if I may, I would like yeah. to end with a uh, small commercial. Um, the book has been published uh, of my own little publishing uh, entity uh, called Editora Valdemar, mm-hmm. uh, which is how the Brazilians uh, pronounce my name. And um, what I want to say is it, it's on Amazon and for each book sold, whether it's a, a Kindle book or uh, the hard copy, five US dollars will go towards a scholarship that I made at the Copenhagen Business School, where they have a small program for international MBA students. And I've given preference for Brazilian students because I learned so much in Brazil and the cocktail of Denmark and Brazil has worked very well for me. So I'm now advocating that the cocktail of Brazil and Denmark could work very well for young Brazilians in their private life and in their career. And therefore, I'm very happy to give $5 for each book sold to to that good purpose. Excellent. I will make sure that the links to your website, the links to Amazon for the book and uh, some of the material that you have available for download is available below this video. Yeah, you know, there's... uh, there's, there's a self-assessment uh, uh, test series that people can do on the website as well. Great. A pleasure. Okay. To you. Thank you very much, Connor, for reaching out. And uh, I look forward to hearing more. And if there's anything more I can do for you, I'm always here. Excellent. I will be reaching out. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Adios. <laughs> Adios.